I'm aware that there are competing attractions outside, such as sunshine and uh, uh, an attractive beach. So thank you for your assiduity in coming back for the fourth time. Um, we, at the beginning of the week, considered briefly and fairly superficially um, what I call dialogue interpreting. And then we wandered away from it. And today I want to wander back in that direction and um, have a look at a particular instance of, of dialogue interpreting and build around that some ideas about what goes on in these events and some of the problems that, that are involved. I, I think I said the other day that dialogue interpreting was not my term. It, it, I don't know where it emerged from, uh, but certainly several scholars were using it before I did. But it, it really came out of this feeling that there needed to be a term which would bring together all of those events where the interpreter and the persons being interpreted for are in face-to-face -face contact with each other. Uh, and where meaning is sort of negotiated between them. And where the speech output goes back and forth in the form of a dialogue. This is contrasted with the stereotypical situation of the conference interpreter who is largely dealing with monologues, a speech that is delivered, say, from somewhere like this, and with interpreters in soundproof booths, maybe at the back of the room, who then interpret simultaneously that monologue. There are all kinds of cognitive as well as non-cognitive aspects of meaning which come to the fore when people are in face-to-face -face contact and when each person's moves are observable by each other person. Uh, and it involves all kinds of things like um, uh, um, body posture, uh, paralinguistic features, kinesics, all of these kinds of things come into the equation. These things have not been at the forefront of the consideration of conference interpreting, quite simply because they don't loom large in such events. And so if you look at the literature, of conference interpreting research, which is really quite voluminous, you will not find much on these kinds of issues. If you look at the just beginning to emerge literature on research into dialogue interpreting, or what other people will, you will find that the emphasis is very large on non-conference issues. Um, I'll take as an example a little uh, article put out by Mona Baker um, four or five years ago on uh, what was done for Saddam Hussein when he was interviewed by Trevor MacDonald for ITV. Um, as you might imagine, that's not a recent event. You can't imagine that having happened in the last year or so. But um, back just before the first Gulf War, there was this notion that you could still gain access to this person, Saddam Hussein, and you could interview him he granted an interview, and the interview was held, and I would say as a piece of communication it was pretty much a disaster, uh, because there wasn't a meeting of minds, so to speak. But the situation of the interpreter in, in that event was analysed by Mark Baker, and of course the emphasis was not so much on the transfer of meaning as on all of the issues to do with power and distance and the immediacy of the situation, the pressure the interpreter is on. So, which really come to the fore in events of, the, of these kinds. Typically, in a lot of such events, we are in the area of sensitive texts. I use that term because it was the title of a, an interesting volume a few years ago, Translating Sensitive Texts. Did you come across that one? Was it by, edited by a man called Sims, I think? But so I like this notion of sensitive texts. That is, wherever language events are involved in things which might involve closely held issues of belief, values, and so on, and where those might come into conflict with each other. Or um, sensitive texts would have to do with, for example, doctor-patient interviews, where doctors might have to uh, deliver bad news to a patient. We are in the domain of sensitive texts and those kinds of things. And a lot of the kinds of material that dialogue interpreters have to deal with involve that kind of sensitivity, which, of course, increases the pressure on the interpreter um, herself in, 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 such, in such events.
Now, a lot of people have said to me, well, okay, we, but we don't need yet another new term. Call it um, what we've been calling it for a number of years, namely community integrity, okay? Or a new term that's evolved in the UK recently, which is public service integrity. But uh, the thing is that uh, the example I gave you just a minute ago, the, the interview with Saddam Hussein, counts amongst what I see as an area, but it, it, it is not an example of public service interpreting, it's not community interpreting. So hence my need to try and frame it slightly wider to encompass all events where the interpreter is in face-to-face -face contact in the situation of dialogue. Okay. And as I did say uh, the other day, these tend to become exchanges where it is a genuine three-party exchange rather than a two-party exchange assisted by a translating machine. Okay? Uh, and that is what interests me in such events. Nevertheless, we can identify two, at least two, but two main, um, distinct styles of interpreting in these situations. One which is used in courtrooms in a lot of countries. I don't know about all because actually there are very, very many countries in the world where the issue of courtroom interpreting is to, remains to this day totally unregulated and um, so, you know, who knows what goes on? All kinds of horrors, no doubt. But, but um, in, in a number of countries it has been regulated. I mentioned the other day the United States where it is quite clear that the training for the interpreters is uh, very definite in what it recommends and what it says must happen and the interpreters all seek to follow a particular model. I haven't observed courtroom interpreting taking place in the United States. I have, however, in Hong Kong, which, uh, where the interpreters are trained according to the American system. And what I found interesting to observe was the way in which the interpreters not only translated in a scrupulous, literal fashion, but included in their own all such things as quotations. He thinks better of it and starts to rent it in so that the goes. Okay, I want to distance myself that the court does this to what language, which is not the language of the court. Um, I think I said it the other day, it is an article of faith for, for um, the courts in these situations that is of intoning of something that is not for the trans deliberately, by the way, today creator for the interpreter because uh, there's this awkward notion of the, the two senses of the verb to interpret. Um, the way we use it, meaning um, to translate in an oral situation, and the way the legal profession would use it, matters of interpretation. That is, what meaning is to be construed from what is said. They regard that as their domain, their preserve, and the mere translator brought in by the way, on low pay, uh, to officiate is nothing more than a minion in this situation and is expected to relay for the benefit of the court in the language of the court whatever has been said, including false starts, hesitations, uh, and almost coughing, I would say, you know, um, for the benefit of the court. Okay. In other fields, however, there is no such stricture on the interpreters, and in a lot of fields, it would seem that there is a great deal of latitude afforded to the translator in these situations. They are relatively unregulated. What I'm going to um, be looking at in uh, a wee while is an instance of immigration hearings. And there, as far as I've been able to observe, will use trained interpreters can get them, and if it's a language combination where quite simply the trained interpreter in short supply, then whoever they can, however, whoever they can get. And, and consequently, in that situation, they to suggest to the interpreter how it is they would have the job done. They just say, uh, and the interpreters have, and so it's almost the opposite pull from the courtroom interpreting situation that I've, that I've dis described. It is, of course, in these types of dialogue interpreting where there is latitude for the interpreters that all of these issues that I brought out on Monday, like footing and the participation framework, and for that matter, issues of politeness and faith, 
then they begin to come to the fore. In the courtroom, they are also issues, but uh, not in quite so overt a fashion. Right. Um, another way of looking at some of this would be in terms of audience design, because, as Anthony Pym pointed out in uh, his article on the O.J. Simpson trial in the United States, and I may have mentioned this the other day, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but I think it's important. Um, most of the people in the courtroom understood both the language of the court English and the language of Rosa Lopez, who was a Spanish-speaking witness from El Salvador who insisted on having an interpreter. Many other Hispanics in that trial did not um, avail themselves of their legal right to have an interpreter. Um, but Rosa Lopez spoke and understood English. She had been in the United States for something like 27 years. Uh, but they have the right to have an interpreter. And Anthony Pym, looking at that situation, notes that in many situations the interpreter is not actually there in reality to provide for communication between parties who otherwise would not be able to communicate with each other, which is the classic situation that you and I might, or, or the lay person might understand interpreting to be about. Um, but rather, they are there as some kind of upholding of human rights or um, ensuring that the legal process takes place with due regard for anything which could be said to be infringing uh, rights of justice and all, and all the rest of it. Uh, so almost a technicality in a way. Moreover, in such situations, and the situations are not as uncommon as all that, um, you find that people who in the courtroom are either auditors or overhearers in our framework from the other day are actually acting as linguistic monitors. In other words, when the attorney is asking a question in English and it's translated into Spanish and the reply comes back from Rosa Lopez uh, in Spanish and then is interpreted into English, the addressee of Rosa Lopez is the attorney who asks the question. The auditors are the judge and the jury and other people uh, who are part of the courtroom linguistic exchange. And the overhearers are the public gallery, those people who are not ratified participants in the event but have the right to be there and listen. And if we're in a virtually a bilingual uh, state like California, um, all of these people are in fact listening eagerly to the English and to the Spanish and possibly gleefully, noticing the interpreter's uh, discomfiture. I, I think it's a very brave interpreter who acts in such situations, actually. Um, but um, this creates added pressure on the interpreter, and certainly the first interpreter, I, I've got an idea that two interpreters were dismissed and exchanged for another, uh, because if then any objection is raised to the kind of translating the interpreter is doing, then in order to ensure that the trial will proceed, you have to change the, the interpreter. So, okay. So, in other words, not only does the translator have to exercise scrupulous accuracy, but the translator has to be seen to be exercising scrupulous accuracy. That was my point about all of these auditors and overhearers, um, that the interpreter realizes that they have to be seen to be, or heard to be, exercising this, this accuracy. Okay, now many scholars have, both within the profession and within the academic community out with the profession, have criticized this legal requirement for interpreting of this kind. Um, Ruth Morris, 1995, and articles in subsequent years is a clear case in point, and if you want a quick entry into this stuff, you could do worse than, than look at her article in the translator, 1995. Um, points out that this situation required by the courts is quite untenable in the sense both that interpreters cannot adhere to, what, to the injunction to, to translate in this manner. Um, they can attempt to do it, they can maybe do it most of the time, but frequently they will have to settle for something less than a complete um, 
representation, if there is such a thing, of, of, this, of the source text. And plenty of examples in Susan Burke Seligson's book that I again mentioned the other day, The Bilingual Courtroom, where she was looking at um, trials in the United States involving Spanish and English, and finding the interpreters struggling, struggling, to be as literal as possible and to represent all of the hesitations and so on. And on crucial matters, failing. Sometimes because of the, um, the differing grammatical structures of English and Spanish. Um, meaning that they have to make some shifts, like we were talking about yesterday. And these shifts can have consequences, for example, in issues of what is called blame attribution or blame avoidance. Um, lawyers will, will seek very often for legal reasons to frame their questions, attorneys will, in, in such a way as to avoid attributing blame. Otherwise it's regarded as a, legal, a leading question which can then be struck out of, of the record. The interpreters know this, they are well trained, but to try and do it in the other language on all occasions it is very, very difficult. So first of all, the interpreters cannot adhere to this throughout and the court seems to be unaware of this. The interpreting community are aware of it, but the court seems to be blissfully unaware of it, and yet still um, insists on this way of proceeding. Secondly, and the more telling point uh, made by Ruth Morris and others, is that insisting on this can actually impede communication rather than assist it. In other words, the literal translation may give the wrong impression, uh, one that was not intended um, and you can all, through your own linguistic knowledge, think of possible examples of that kind of thing. Sandra Hill, 1997, gives some good examples in her um, article that came out of... Um, there have been some very good conferences in Canada on this called The Critical Link, Interpreters in the Community. They hold one of these every three years. Um, there was one, or there's one just next year in Sweden, but there were two or three in Canada, and the, gave rise to a whole range of literature in the published proceedings, which, if you're interested in this kind of thing, uh, you could do worse than, than, than to read. Okay, so this notion that this particular style of interpreting can impede communication rather than assist it is now almost an orthodoxy within dialogue interpreting research. Many people are saying it. They've um, provided plenty of evidence to back it up. And so... By implication, this would suggest that a different style of interpreting is required, perhaps one involving far more latitude for the interpreter. But what I want to suggest today is that if you go in the other direction, there are dangers for communication as well. So I'm taking as read this point that I've now labored a bit for the last five or seven minutes on um, the pitfalls of this literal approach to the interpreting exercise and the I also want to pursue the issue of relevance that I've introduced uh, over the past couple of days. Um, as I said, Ernst August Gut um, sought to apply relevance theory to the issue of translating. In his book, he makes a couple of references to interpreting, but doesn't go beyond that. But by the same token, it should be, if it is valid for translating, it should be valid for interpreting. And I want to explore that in a very minor way. Uh, it would take us a month or so and several books to pursue this through to the end. And in the time that we've got, we can't go into it very far. But um, I want to look at the application of the principle of relevance to the interpreter. And um, again, as in previous days, I want to adopt a descriptive approach rather than a prescriptive approach because it might be very easy, I'll say this before you see the little samples of data, it might be very easy to cut discussion short simply by saying that what you're going to see is bad interpreting. But, you know, if we do that, and I think there's a little caveat here for a whole of our endeavours in translation studies, if we rush straight to judgment at the beginning and say, well, actually, this is just poor translating or whatever, we are denying ourselves the opportunity to see what happens when things go wrong 
Um, very often it is when you look at, I, said, I was making this point to somebody in my conversation the other day, when you look at communication breakdown, you get insights into what communication needs to have in order to proceed smoothly. Uh, and so it's, there are lots of studies in social linguistics where they simply look at instances of breakdown uh, to get more insight into communication process. Okay. I guess we might all uphold the principle as translators and interpreters that we would hope that our endeavours in some small way would lead to more of a meeting of minds. I'm now being sort of very highfalutin and lofty, but you know, we, it's there somewhere at the background of all of our discourses on translation that we might think that because we are at the interface of cultures and languages, and who says language says culture, so let's just say cultures, um, we are somehow seeking to facilitate contacts to establish more common ground between interlocutors uh, of different languages and, uh, and cultures. Um, and I take that to be something which is an assumption, which is there at least in the background. However, in the situation of immigration encounters, be it asylum hearings, where people from um, various countries are seeking to gain asylum from persecution in their country of origin, in a country such as, uh, shall we say, Canada, because that's the example that I want to, to choose just immediately. Um, in these situations, there is a danger that this kind of common ground that might be sought not only doesn't come about, but cannot come about. There are some very interesting publications by a guy called Robert Barsky, some of you may have come across um, Barsky's work, where he is looking at the issue of alienation in Canadian refugee hearings. And he is able to document by many case studies <coughs> the way in which those asylum seekers who are successful, that is the very few, of course, as in Britain and most other Western countries, um, the ones who succeed are a small minority. Those who succeed appear to be those who are most successful in abandoning their own modes of speaking, their own discourses, their own native genres of speech, and adopting those genres and discourses which are the ones which are valued by the host community. It stands to reason, doesn't it, in a way. In other words, of course, if you are trying to gain uh, asylum in Canada and the hearings are held in English and your English is poor, you're already off to a poor start. If you're dependent on an interpreter, you're probably off to a worse start. Except that, and here again, Barsky has documented plenty of instances of this, there seems to be a trend whereby interpreters, while striving to preserve their own neutrality as far as possible, tend to turn incoherent responses into coherent responses and thus are somehow assisting us in seeming to have more coherent linguistic output than in fact they, they do have, um, for all kinds of reasons. And, you know, I, I stress this business of, nat of, of their, their own source native genres and discourses, because ways of speaking in rural Pakistan will not be those ways of cogent argument that are appreciated uh, in uh, immigration service hearings in Croydon, south of London, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so the linguistic output will simply not be, not be valued. Um, in these situations, one has to wonder how much of a kind of a seeking of common ground between asylum seekers and those who interrogate them there actually is. It would seem it's an all or nothing game where you either abandon your own culture uh, and, and linguistic habits, or else you are unsuccessful. Okay. Um, 
So it's not just only Parsons, but from a range of other studies that I mentioned, that interpreters do tend to fully articulate statements and coherent ones, or to compensate for a client's lack of awareness of how should appropriately behave in language terms in a, in a type language uh, situation. Um, also, there is the issue of placework. And this here, I'm just did very, very briefly into politeness theory, uh, whereby within a culture, people are well able to judge what constitutes a face-threatening act and what does not. And where there is a face-threatening act within the ambient discourse or within the ambient exchange, um, what needs to be done to mitigate that threat to face? Immigration officers are aware of that simply. Uh, Inspectors are aware of that instantly. Claimants are aware of that instantly. But the point is, what constitutes a really face-threatening act? The duplication as well are cultural variants. It stands to reason they're bound to be. Even to take very, very simple and straightforward examples, like in many of the languages of Western Europe, if you want to ask uh, somebody um, for, for some trivial, like, uh, I have a cigarette, you just used to inherit it. Give me a cigarette. Okay? In British English, that would be seen as a face threatening act, an unmitigated one. Now, that doesn't matter, hardly matters, but from that trivial example, you can see all of the ways in which something which is linguistically sessioned as a normal way of behaving in one language culture becomes face threatening in another culture. The courts haven't thought that way in, you know, in their um, advice to interpreters. But in these immigration hearings, what the interpreter does or does not do about this is going to become crucial. And so that has to do with the kinds of things I'm talking about. Um, there is also much evidence that interpreters aware of face threatening acts act in defense of their own face as well. That is, they not only seek to mitigate any face threatening act between um, a client and the original officer, but anything which they perceive as face threatening or face, they will tend to mitigate. Helen Tevel has not where she's looking at doctor patient interview, and she finds that very often uh, when the doctor gets a diagnosis that is really bad news, uh, quite often the reply will be the diagnosis is transmitted with hedges. Tone it down. Things like uh, one of the uh, examples where the doctor tells the patient that she has high blood pressure and comes out in interpretation as your blood pressure is a little raised. Yeah? Now, you can see how in certain situations this can be crucial. Because if you lull a patient into a false sense of security, uh, they may behave in such a manner that they don't realize the danger they're in. The literature, actually, and the anecdotal experience is very rich with examples. It's like um, a critical link conference. Just give one more uh, little example. It's inherent in the situation, again I may have mentioned this the other day, I remember that very often the interpreter, although totally neutral, transitively neutral, will be of the same ethnic origin as one of the parties, typically as the client who needs the attorney. Um, this is a matter of in-groups and out-groups, which I introduced earlier on. In-groups and out-groups are crucial in these events. So, imagine the situation. The doctor asks the patient, are you taking any other medication? The interpreter scrupulously interprets that. The patient, who is sitting very close to the interpreter and to already establish rapport, because they have the same language, the same community, possibly even the same geographical origin, says gently to the interpreter, well, actually, I'm also taking X, Y, Z, don't tell him that. Now, you know, I could have fun here and now and ask you how you as interpreters would handle that. It's a huge dilemma. Tell the doctor and you've sacrificed the patient's trust for good and all. Don't tell the doctor and then the consequences could be severe. And, and uh, so, you know, interpreters constantly feel this pressure and the advice amongst them is this, even though we to this day do not have a good code of practice for dialogue interpreting. One which will span the different uh, fields of dialogue interpreting uh, and where it can be made available to clients so that they know what to expect as well as the interpreter of what to expect. But the point you, I, as I detect in the profession, is that really the interpreters should instruct at the beginning of any account before any exchange takes place. I will, I'm going to translate everything you say. Say that to a party. To avoid any substance. 
later on. At any rate, all I was trying to do there was to illustrate the kinds of serious problems that can arise from situations that are like this. Right. Now, these encounters that I just want to talk about this afternoon, very briefly, are something that was actually put out on public service television in the UK. So it's very much public domain stuff. That's the only way I've managed to get access to it. But um, it, it was there. Unusually for British television, the interpreter's turn was as much as the other two interviews. There was no voiceover. You got the whole thing. These were some immigration interviews that were held following the arrest of some illegal immigrants in pay. Some, uh, a group of Polish people who had been working in London hotels had been arrested in some kind of raid by the police because uh, they'd found they were working without a permit. And the immigration services aim was to get people on the midday flight back to Warsaw. That's the same way these things are dealt with in the UK, you know, um, here without a permit, right in plane, back you go. Uh, nevertheless, interviews have to take place during which the immigrants have to ask a range of standard questions so that there is a some semblance of justice is sort of that don't know. But these are situations and um, it's kind of a routine encounters in which the facts are rapidly established. It's a brisk question and answer session, a series of questions, he has to come back. And it's all standardized so that in effect the editors would really they know the questions and they, they have a routine more or less for the form of the questions. Okay. In these situations I found very little evidence of literalism at all. A great deal of latitude on how the interpreters. There were several different interpreters uh, observed in sessions. Moreover, very little evidence of any kind of linguistic monitoring taking place. In the sense that in courtrooms, these were taking place in a closed room where there was the immigration officer, the illegal immigrants, uh, and the interpreter, and the television companies, but they were in a sense um, eavesdroppers on the situation because their presence was known, but they were not um, participants in, in the exchange. There was no one there, as in the Pim's court, OJ says courtroom, listening to what was happening and saying, wait a minute, this is a bit like that. Okay, so that's, that's the situation. It was quite clear from the paralinguistic you know, of the situation that the, the translators enjoyed confidence of the immigration services were employed by them, and their moves were quite unchallenged by the Indeed, there is a, seems to be an assumption in such situations that common right, this phrase that I, was, I put up at the beginning, exists already. In other words, yes, the interpreter is needed because the immigration officer doesn't speak Polish, but in any case, these hearings should take place in English. And yes, these um, poor Polish people um, were genuinely monical and needed an uh, interpreter. But um, the notion of any cultural me mediation to take place that was, was totally foreign. That is, that the assumptions on which all parties were working were assumed to be, in Sperry Wilson's terms, mutually manifest. The, inter the immigration officer would assume that the conversation was taking place on the same set of assumptions as the Bush um, interviewee would hold. That everyone holds the same set of assumptions, they're in the same usual context, and therefore communication can proceed unhindered. <coughs> okay, so in situations like this, and here I come to the point, and communicator A may assume that what is manifest to him or her is also manifest to communicator B, and vice versa. For example, in, at one point in one of the interviews, the immigration officer says, in English, this verbatim, and you will recognize this, no doubt. I must caution you, you do not have to say anything, but it may harm your face if you do not mention when questioned something you later rely on. What's the point about it? It's a stereotype formula. It is something which has to be said at the beginning of all such hearings. In that form, actually, um, you know, that's the form of words that is used. It's like reading from a written. That's it. You can't make the assumption, but I guess you do make the assumption, that what that counts in speech act terms is a universally general value. That is, saying that in English and having it interpreted in the language, the words and sense will be interesting. but the fact that it constitutes and counts as a legal warning, how can we guarantee that the recipient receives it as counting as that? 
It's like that's, that's just an example. I'm not building a big thing on that. It is to show that this assumption, that everybody shares the same assumptions, is an erroneous assumption. It must be. Interpreters are clearly aware of that. Yes, they're intercultural aware, they're aware of that, and that they make adjustments. They make adjustments in their public to ensure, as far as they're able, and when they're able, not in the courtroom, but in things like this, when they're able to, they make adjustments to try and ensure that the, the mutual assumptions are moving closer to each other, or counts as something in one language, have something pretty similar in other. They will do this. What happens adjustments? In other words, how does the translator know when they overstepped the mark or when they overcompensated, when they've gone too far? How much they ought to say, how much they ought to be mediating with one another? Well, it's here that that idea comes in because of this notion of achieving the least contextual effect in exchange for the minimum process effect. Don't forget, I characterized dialogue interpreting that day as urgent interpreting. It takes place in real time. You have no time station. Uh, an interpreter who, like some of my beginners from time to time, um, as soon as a turn stops, they look in notes, read through them, and after about a minute and a half, begin to translate. Professionally, wouldn't ask more than one in front if you did that. You, it's, you have to respond on the spot, especially when it's a brisk question and answer session. So, people's time is a premium. So, it's a question of, in exchange for that minimum effort, making the maximum effect that you can. And so there's always this balancing effect, and it would seem, or it seems at least plausible, to suggest that this is the kind of mechanism that brings how much the interpreter will say, or how little they know it, and so on. Um, <clears throat> contextual effect, use that term again, just to, to remind you, contextual effect is, it, it, it means an improvement to the assumptions a language user already has about in other words, communication is about adding something to what we already feel, know, assume, or whatever. And so a textual effect is something we've asked about. You see, you know, a completely redundant statement telling you something you know completely adds nothing. Therefore, it is wasted effort. It is, it is not a maximum contextual effect in exchange for the effort expended. That's why communication regulates this, in the sense that communication has to be a mixture of new and old. If everything you say is new, there is communication overload. If nothing you say is new, then nothing is committed. So there is this other effect as well. We, one could go into this at great length, but we, we, we won't because it's now time is, is getting and I'll, I'll want to, to move on. Right. Um, let's assume then that we have our interpreter acting in these exchanges with the intercultural knowledge that she or he will have to make cultural actions or changes from time to time, and will do so in a way consistent with this notion of providing the maximum effect for the minimum cost in terms of effort. Okay? At one point, um, the immigration officer always starts by um, asking the person where they entered the United Kingdom, and did they see an immigration officer at the point of entry? Those are the two first standard questions. The next question. The next question that he asks is this. This is your English, very English, I would say. You might notice the word, why I say very. Um, the form of his next point. So he said, where did you enter the, the United Kingdom? Um, did you see an immigration? officer at the point of entry. Next one. That immigration officer would ask you some questions. Consider that utterance just, just briefly. First of all, is it a statement or a question? It's a question, but it has the linguistic form of a statement. Yes. Think of your intercultural situation and the hapless immigrant who would reply, yes, that's right. Um, but there's more to it than that. First of all, um, it's in the form of a statement when it really is a question. And secondly, some questions is very vague. And so, in other words, what kind of response does the immigration officer want? It's not clear even to me, let alone some 
poor, you know, monolinguistic Pole who, who, who doesn't share this language and is relying on the interpreter. It's not clear to me either. So there's the, the statement question thing, the fact that the phrase some questions is vague, and then there is the pragmatics of that immigration officer would ask you. As uh, linguistic analysts, how do you assess would, the would there? What does that mean? What does it communicate? So, in other words, there is an implicature there. That's, that's what the Gricean pragmatics would say, there is an implicature, according to which, really, you ought to read this as meaning, I know he did, so what did, he, you, know, what did you say to him? Okay? Now, when you see the way in which you can't take that utterance at surface value, but you have to infer, and you have to do work on it. It's interesting to see how the interpreter turned it into Polish. Now, I've reproduced the um, Polish text here. I don't understand, but I don't there any. Great, great, okay. Well, um, there are some extra things about the Polish interpreter's use of Polish which we'll comment on at the end, and your, your views will be very interesting, because there are some very non-standard things happening here. But I want to suspend that for the time being, because I want to concentrate on the dynamics of the, of the exchange. But the literal English version, as given to me by my Polish assistant who translated it, uh, the official asked you two questions. What did you say to him? Why did you come here? All right? So... This is my first example of the interpreter being aware of the non-straightforwardness of the utterance to be interpreted and an attempt in minimum extra time, at the cost of minimum extra effort, filling in those extra elements which will enable the interviewee to reply in a meaningful way. That's the way I would put it. Okay? Now, of course, this begs all kinds of questions which we're coming to. Okay? But you see the way it's done. The point is, as I've already suggested, TR for the translator or interpreter, but let's call it translator, um, has been through this routine before. If she's been in, uh, employed by the immigration services for a number of years, she will have done this, my goodness, how many times. She knows the questions. So she knows that the thing about that immigration officer would ask you some questions. She knows that actually there are two standard questions that are asked at point of entry. And one of them is, for what reason are you entering the United Kingdom? And if the person says, I've come here to work, they say, straight back out again, sorry, unless you've got to work permit. Um, so, in this way, the interpreter is assisting the client to give a relevant response. Right. So how far does it go? Well, first of all, let's note that it doesn't just happen in that direction. That is, that the interpreter is in cahoots with the immigration services, knows the questions, and makes them more explicit. In reply to another question about um, what were your working hours, uh, this was said to a Polish man by the, an immigration officer. And... The reply that came back from the Polish man was this. You might find this interesting. Okay, so, um, how many hours a day were you working? That is, I had eight hours mop and two hours high park. Okay? Clear? Not very. <laughs> right. Let's go straight to the interpreter. The interpreter, the translator, Instead of translating that, let's imagine a courtroom interpreter would be duty-bound to, to translate into English. That is, I had, what was it, um, eight hours mop and two hours high pump. This interpreter, as I said, with much more latitude, says back in Polish to the Polish man, but from ten till six here at the hotel? Polish man, back. Translation to the immigration officer. Right, 
I worked nights at the hotel from 10 till 6 in the morning, and then from 6 till 8 I was picking up rubbish in Hyde Park. That, alas, is what these poor people have to do, even to manage to, to get into the UK, and then they're sent straight back out again. However, that's not our topic. We won't go on to that. Um, but you see the way in which the interpreter, perceiving a response to be, to, to be demanding a lot of processing effort, in other words, if you think and think and think about it, and also with the benefit of hindsight, now you can see what eight hours block means. And actually, with a lot of thinking, you could get it, but it's maximum processing effort to make sense of that. The interpreter is able to improve relevance by <coughs> reducing the processing effort required of the immigration officer, by making a very coherent statement, um, and give a contextual effect, which is the one that the immigration officer wants. Uh, that is, you can total up the hours, okay? You know how many hours in, in, in every 24, which was the question that was asked. So, with these two little examples that I've given you, what I'm trying to show is that pretty systematically throughout, the interpreter is doing this, is judging the ways in which she can make the answers relevant to the questions, to promote communication in such a way that the other parties do not have to use extra processing effort more than they need to in order for the exchange to proceed. <coughs> but this is beginning to be dangerous, isn't it? Because the question is, if, if an interpreter can do this, what are the limits? And if we go back to our production format from Monday, this is the interpreter working not as animator, as in a courtroom, not as author, as in a normal interpreting situation, but actually as principal. She is producing her own linguistic output, not governed by anything that was said, and it becoming a participant, a fully-fledged participant in the exchange. And indeed, you could almost, well, no, I'll say that, I was going to say co-interrogator. But that comes in a bit. Okay. Please, yes. According to what is there, we may suppose that the interpreter has talked before with the, with the person. Yes. Because she how does have. he know that he works in a hotel? And how does he know that he begins work at 10? Yes. You know? So it, it's extra information yeah. that he knows. Yeah. It, it, the situation is this. I mean, you're quite right. And the situation is archetypal because what happens is as from the moment these people are arrested, the police contact the agency and say, we need some Polish interpreters down here pretty quick. We'll need them all morning, uh, but you should be free by 1 p.m. because they would be on the lunchtime flight back to Warsaw. That's the situation. The interpreters come rushing in. They are put straight in contact with the clients, these Polish people. And they sit around talking for an hour, waiting for this hearing to be done. And, you know, that is the situation in so many um, cases. I've experienced it my, myself. You know. So, you, so you get this. Yes. Go on. No, no, I mean, if it was just a real situation, the first time they met, you know, yes. the interpreter wouldn't be able to... No, she would to probably have to. <laughs> she would probably, well, she... If they'd not met before, she would have to do one of two things. Either behave like a court interpreter and just say eight hours mop to the puzzlement of the immigration officer, or she would ask a more explicit question and say, what on earth do you mean? And, you know, yeah. But um, it is precisely because the interpreters do meet their clients before the exchange begins that you get this in-group relationship developing which the interpreter then has to try and extricate herself from, and it's very difficult. So it's part of the, part of the problem as well. Okay. Um, so we've not, noted the shift of footing there. Um, but it's not actually what was said. So the, the immigration officer here has not had access to what was actually said by the Polish man. I then went back to Ernst August Gut to see what he had to say about what are the limits on this relevance principle of maximum 
contextual effect, the minimum process in effect, because it seems, doesn't it, very receiver orientated. Do you see what I mean? That is, you are judging the maximum contextual effect for the receiver, and you're judging the minimum uh, processing effort for the receiver. There's nothing in that little formula, max effect for minimum effort, to suggest how close you need be to what was actually said. So there's something missing here. So back I go to Hans August Wood, who has a few pages on this. Interesting. He introduces the notion, and again, it comes from Sperber and Wilson. He's always very careful to draw these things straight out of the original relevance theory. The notion of what he calls interpretive resemblance. And he says that the utterances have to show resemblance to the source text as a producer-orientated guarantee of proper, proper ways of proceeding, and so on. So, a third element is introduced into this relevance theory, namely that of interpretive resemblance. So, yes, maximum effect for minimum effort, always as long as it is consistent with interpretive resemblance. However, it still begs the question, we're not out of the wood yet, because what's, what, how much interpretive resemblance? What are the limits on interpretive resemblance? Um, when would interpretive resemblance be properly shown, and when would it be, fail to be properly shown? And he has a couple of interesting sentences, which I quote to you. He says, only in those respects that can be expected to make it adequately relevant to the receptor language audience. Well, that's interesting. So, the translator's output need resemble the source text only to the extent that it makes it adequately relevant to the receiver group. Okay? And again, the translation, he says, should be expressed. Note he's becoming a little bit uh, prescriptive here. Not very descriptive. But it should be expressed in such a manner that it yields the intended interpretation without putting the audience to unnecessary processing effort. Okay, well, the way that's put prescriptively it could almost be in the training manual for interpreters. This is what you should do, okay? Um, don't put the audience to unnecessary processing effort, etc. Let's note in passing that that notion of interpretive resemblance would be disputed by many translation scholars who might simply say, the translator should say what was said in the first place. You, you're familiar with that approach to the translation studies. Uh, but what Good says there, even though it seems to be contentious, does seem to match the kind of evidence that we're seeing here. This does seem to be the way these interpreters, there were several of them in these exchanges, are behaving. That is, they are interpretively resembling what was originally said only to the extent that they ensure the maximum effect to the audience in exchange for the minimum effort. But there's an ethical problem, isn't there? Because how can the monolingual parties to the exchange know that what they are getting resembles what was said? If this is the principle, and if the interpreter behaves in this way, there is, it seems to be, no guarantee. How can the Polish man know what the immigration officer's question was if it is mediated in this way by the interpreter? And at this point, that's just a theoretical point, but my next two examples, I want to illustrate what seem to be the pitfalls that underlie that question. Um, the next couple of examples relate to discourses. And what I would say are the notion of positive values and shared values. Let me explain. Another standard question, or at least I don't know if it's standard, but in all of these hearings I noticed that the immigration officer asked it standardly. How is it that you're still in this country? Okay. The translator, why are you still here? Hmm. More direct, but never mind, that's not the point. Polish woman, because I wanted to go to school here, till now I've managed to. I had to earn money to go to school because school is quite expensive. 
three mentions of school. You're going to notice my habit of picking out reiterations. Um, it's becoming a quirk of mine, isn't it, in, in these days? Uh, but I notice here some kind of insistence on school, such that it seems to me, underlying this utterance, there is a notion that school, or education, is something to be valued. And therefore, perhaps, a noble or worthy reason for seeking entry to the UK, or for staying on beyond the length of a tourist visa. Okay? It doesn't matter whether the Polish woman realizes that she's doomed as an immigrant, she's going to be put back on the flight at lunchtime. These people still have self-respect, and in answer to a question, they may wish to put forward things which they see as values which are to be aspired to. Moreover, monoculturally, we often assume, when we are monoculturally, monocultural, that those values that we aspire to are also the values that other people aspire to. And it's not always a warranted assumption. Our Polish translator now. Translating this because I wanted to go to school in Sweden. I had to, my intention was to attend an English course here, but I didn't have enough money, so I had to earn the money in order to pay for the course. Okay. Right. Um, that's one exchange. That's my example number three, but let me go on to another one in the immediate environment, but this time. Um, no, oh, actually, it's part of the same exchange. I'm sorry, it is. Yes, that's right. The Polish woman proceeds. Having had that bit translated, she goes on. And I still go to school. I did go to school once a week, unfortunately. By the way, the pragmatics of that, unfortunately. How does that come across? I went to school, unfortunately? No. Once a week, unfortunately. You have to infer that once a week, she would have liked to go more, but she could only afford, it's very expensive, once a week. How does this come out? And I have been attending an English course once a week. What I see here is a discourse. And I don't see it coming through. And maybe, you know, relaying this discourse is not consistent with minimum processing effort. Let's get this through. Let's get it done. It doesn't matter what the answer is anyway, frankly. The outcome of the interview is going to be the same. Let's get through it. And a whole discourse here uh, disappears. I'm reading too much, aren't I, into one little exchange. So let's have another one. This time a Polish man. What were you doing before that in Poland? Translator, and what were you doing in Poland before coming here to England? Polish man, I was learning in school. Translator, as a student? No, Karl Mechanic. Translator to the immigration officer. Right, he was attending a course at Karl Mechanic schools. Okay. Again, the notion of schooling, of education, of valuing things, valuing learning and so on, somehow seems to me to have gone out the window um, in, in this exchange. And thus, what I'm suggesting here is that this shaky notion of interpretive resemblance, that is, only in as much as is relevant to the receiver is very flaky in a situation like this. In other words, the interpreter can well say to herself, the immigration officer doesn't want to know about all this. Right? Let's minimize the processing effort and let's give whatever contextual effect is that which is consistent. Only in as far as it is relevant to the receiver. And on those grounds, translations like this can almost, but not quite, be justified. And so, um, you know, what I'm here doing in my modest iconoclastic way is casting some doubt on a whole tenet of, of relevance theory, which, one, does seem to describe what these interpreters do, but two, leaves the door open to all kinds of excesses, which seem to me not warranted. Um, what the divergences here do not do, and that's for sure, and I'm now beginning to get to my conclusion and linking up to what I was saying at the beginning, they do not uh, reduce the cultural distance between 
is no attempt here to look to common shared values in the translation, such as to ensure that both parties are on common ground. It's simply not happening. Okay, so um, the other thing to notice here, and of course um, it, the other half is, is the footing. The translator now has definitely become uh, not just an inquirer seeking to clarify something which was obscure, like eight hours mock, the translator has now become a co-interrogator, uh, asking about the content of the courses that someone was doing in Poland before they came. Um, so, to, to round it off and sum up, the interpreter meets the communicative needs of her addressee, the immigration officer, and preserves their mutual cognitive environment, but at the same time, um, completely shuts out the person she's uh, in interpreting for. Surely, though, the interviewees, for whose benefit the interpreter has been called in, are entitled to expect that their own intended contextual effects will be given precedence over the receiver's need for ease of processing, it seems to me. What one could speculate did this Polish man think got through to the immigration officer and the Polish woman beforehand? A. They may truly monolingually have assumed that all this business about aspiring to schooling and education was translated faithfully. They may well have assumed so. If they didn't assume so, if they had enough words of English to notice that it wasn't getting across at all, they will come to the conclusion which, by the way, most such people come to anyway. That is, namely, that the interpreter is an agent of the oppressive authorities who are oppressing them, and therefore someone not to be trusted anyway. And uh, that is right the way back to Barsky's studies, where he finds that that is the conclusion reached by 80 or 90 percent of the asylum seekers um, who rely on interpreters in Canada. Okay? Finally, Given common ground is reduced rather than increased, it's ironic to notice that there is a routine ending to all of these. Um, no, sorry. No, final example, before I come to the final statement, but I am concluding in the next couple of minutes, I do promise you. Um, a final example to sort of clinch this, uh, just put it out as it is. In immigration officer, what did they say? translator, and what did they say? Polish man, that we'll travel to work to England. Translator, what does it mean, we'll travel? Because there were more? Polish man, yes. Translator, yes, this is to the immigration officer. They said they'd go to work in England because apparently he wasn't the only one, there were several people in Poland. Okay. The interpreter is serving the communicative needs of the immigration officer very well indeed. Uh, whether she is working for her client or not is another matter entirely. Finally, it is ironic to note that there is a routine ending to all of these interviews where after the interview has come to the end, the immigration officer has asked all the questions she or he uh, needs to ask. Uh, they, then, they then change their footing and suddenly become very co conciliatory. Yes. Don't worry, you won't have to pay for your flight back to Warsaw. Uh, it's at 12 o'clock, you won't have to wait long, you'll be home soon. This kind of discourse suddenly emerges, okay? But that's what, not what I wanted to comment on. Uh, the final thing is the standard ending. The last question which the immigration officer always asks is, have you understood everything? And the reply invariably comes back, yes. Okay, so I rest my case and I'll stop there and I'll be interested to get reactions from